thank the pastor and the committee for giving me an opportunity to share the word of God this evening with, with each of you. I look forward to the voice of God spoken today through the spoken word and also the written word. You know, there are also scholars and people who are very intellectual, but I pray that as I am here, I pray that God would use me to speak to us this evening. The topic that I've chosen for today is a little different from the regular topic, unity for justice and peace. It's more about contentment. So um, it's about contentment. I've chosen the passage that we just heard from Philippians chapter 4, beginning from verse 8 to 20. And I can make this um, topic, contentment, it's an ironic concept in our culture today. Contentment, you can hear this word a lot, but I'm not sure how many of us have been able to practice this contentment. Everyone uh, you know, looks forward to contentment. Everyone looks forward. If only I had a better job, if I would have a better salary, if I would have a better family, if I would have a better home, if I would have a better car, or if I would have a bigger bank balance, then I would be content. Each of us are looking for just that one thing, you know, which is very close to contentment. We think that, like, you know, we need that. If only I had that, you know, I would be more content. But can we be content right now? is the question, with what we have. I want to take you to um, Philippines uh, 4 and verse 11. Paul clearly talks here that in whatever situation, he's able to be content. We also see that Paul you know, tells Timothy as well that like godliness with contentment is great gain. So we see that Paul clearly talks about this and he is able to really articulate what contentment is and how he can exemplify his own life to be content. He also shares the secret to be content. And that is what we are going to be looking um, this evening from the scripture. So, without much delay, let me just take you through these two major things that can help us to be content. Two things. It's a two-point sermon, so two things. Number one is a proper way of thinking. A proper way of thinking, which we read in Philippines verse 4. I want to read to you verse 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace be with you, will be with you. If we are looking forward to be content in our lives, we need to have the right way of thinking. What is in your mind, you know, is invariably like what will you be in action? What is, you know, when you say the rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, you know, you keep meditating on that, you are going to be happy. Paul clearly says that if only you fill your minds with the right things, you know, and he also tells what those right things are. And that is not just something to just keep in mind. Paul clearly tells that like, hey, you just need to keep this in mind. No. But he's asking us to go one step ahead, like where it says meditate on these. Not just something to keep in mind, but to meditate on it. The Greek word here is to calculate, is to count, is to ponder upon. And I think as Christians, we need to look at what we meditate on, what we actually think about, what are we pondering about. 
And I think that would shape our attitude and definitely it would shape our actions as well. What are we going to be thinking about? What are we going to be focusing about? Paul talks about these things. Number one, think about whatever is true. Whatever is true. Number two, whatever is honorable. Whatever is just. Whatever is pure. Whatever is lovely. Whatever is commendable. Excellence. Anything worthy of praise. Think about these things. And I think it's, it requires at least so many hours to kind of really go over each of this. And I think uh, we, we, we are able to really understand this very clearly. And I think we need to go home and probably look at each of this in depth for us to understand what God is trying to meditate us on. Whatever is true. True is something that like, you know, is, is opposite of lies. And this is definitely not from the worldly things, you know, truth is some, something from the Lord Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is honorable, and whatever is just. Today we heard a beautiful message this morning on justice. How is it going to be, you know, justice is not just equity. It is more than, it's more than that. It is more than caring for each other. It's more than to kind of really love each other. Whatever is pure, it's a very deep word. Purity is something that God expects us to be meditating on. Purity. Purity. Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, excellence, that's a wonderful value that we got to have in our lives. I mean, these are all great values that we got to have in our lives and we need to meditate on. Anything worthy of praise. These are, these are the things that, you know, Paul clearly talks about, these things. And, and uh, I'm just moving on. Not only he's asking us to meditate, you know, that is what he says in verse 8, in verse 9, you can just see that whatever, whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. He not only asks us to meditate, to be pure and to be honorable and to just and to kind of be lovely and commendable and all this, but he also asks us to practice these in our lives. Of course, Paul practiced it, and that's how he is able to uh, boldly say this. I think we may need to understand that we need to kind of practice these things. And I think it also comes with uh, a, a, a kind of um, a consequence or a, or, a, or a result. When you do that, the God of peace will be with you. Two things. Number one, meditate and then do. Meditate and then do. So once when you do the, you know, do these two, meditate and do, the peace of God is always with us. Today, uh, so many of us, you know, have that lack, the peace of mind. And that peace is something that cannot be given by, you know, uh, the worldly things or cannot be given by our friends or families or things. The peace of God is something beyond all of that. The peace of God that can, you know, that, 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 cannot, that can be transformed. It is beyond comprehension, and only the God of peace can kind of give that. So, I'm connecting back to contentment. Content and peace goes hand in hand. If you meditate on the right things and do the right things, the God of peace is going to be with you, and that's a great big promise. So, Therefore, what we set our minds on is the way we can shape the way we speak and the way we act. Let me repeat that. What we set our minds on invariably is the way we are going to be shaping ourselves, is the way we are going to be speaking, is the way we are going to be acting. Whatever is inside is the one which actually comes outside. They say that, Chatti Agapai Whatever is in your mind, 
invariably will be your action. Let me just take you through to Luke chapter 12, verse 34. Luke chapter 12, verse 34. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that is a big knowledge. That is wisdom. If our minds and our hearts are consumed with these things, we are going to be attracted to do those things. You know, if, we, if our minds are attracted, if our minds are consumed, if our hearts are consumed with these love, uh, uh, this true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, these things, you know, we are going to be attracted to the, do these things. That is what will attract you. However, if our minds are going to be filled with lies, lust, and things that are not of good report, it is definitely not going to help us. It's definitely not going to edify our lives. So today, what will our minds be on? You know, what do we have in our mind? What do we have in our hearts? And, Pop, and the teaching of Paul very clearly talks about the bringing the truth alive. You know, as it's seen in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, which says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. You know, the Hebrew word for, um, you know, word direct, he will direct your path. It says, direct is to make your path smooth is to make your life journey smooth, you know? So do not lean on your understanding. Um, you know, here it clearly says that, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, it very clearly says that lean on God's understanding. Do not lean on your own understanding, but lean on His understanding. Our thoughts leads to actions. Our thoughts will either lead us towards Jesus or probably lead us away from Jesus. What your thoughts are. And I think it's a time for us to introspect, to take an inventory of our lives, to see what is in our mind. What is it that fills our mind very often? What is it that fills our mind when we are at home? What is it that fills our mind when we are alone? What is it that fills our mind when we are at workplace? What is that that fills our mind in our college? And so I think we got to kind of take an inventory of our lives. What are we watching on TV? What are we discussing with others? Is it, you know, the things that are listed here in verse 8? Or is it something else? Are we kind of, what are we doing on the social media? Today, the social media is a very big, big addiction to not just the people who are unbelievers, but also to those who are, you know, believers. Sometimes it is very captivating. You just think of like, you know, having spending about five to ten minutes, but it becomes like, you know, almost an hour, and you don't even know that the time just flew away. And, and today we also have a lot of attractive things, worldly things, what, are, what is our mind on? What material stuff are we desiring? And I think we got to think about these to fill our minds with, you know, to have a crucial, like, crucial thing about, like, about Jesus, about the, about the one that Paul talks here in the Philippines, chapter 4, verse 8. We got to fill it. And that is content. That is content. So the first is to have a proper way of thinking. The second point and the final point, that is, Christ is our strength. Paul, you know, from verse 10 onwards to all the way till verse 20 in this chapter, Philippians chapter 4, from verse 10 to 20, summarizes this particular point of Christ being his strength. And the same applies to us. Christ is our strength today. And Paul, when you look at verse 10, he uh, expresses his appreciation to the fellow believers in Philippi, the church in Philippi. 
And uh, verse 10, he says, I rejoiced in the Lord, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. And then, of course, as he goes on in verse 14, you know, it says, yet I w it was kind for you to, sh you know, to share my trouble. Because the Philippine church shared in his trouble. In verse 15, they were the only church, you know, uh, that helped Paul when he left to, you know, Macedonia, when he left Macedonia for ministry. In verse 16, you know, they, you know, they send aids to him, so he, 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 he says, once again, you know, for my necessity. He's, they've been continuously helping Paul. They've been continuously supporting Paul. And why? Because they loved him. And they knew it was the right thing to do. Verse 17 and 18, let me take you to verse 17 and 18. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. It's not that like, you know, uh, Paul wanted people always to help him. But here he very clearly says that not that I seek the gift, it's not that I seek the gift, but I kind of appreciate the gift that you are giving. But I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. You know, as, as people give, it increases the fruit to their credit. And I think very clearly Paul is practicing what he had preached in verse 8. Paul preached in verse 8. You know, think about these things. But verse 18, we see that Paul had practiced, you know, what he had preached, which is, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. It must have been a very bold statement that Paul is making here. And when we know the context in which he has written this, he's writing this when he was in, the, in jail. And it must, what, it, what it must have been for Paul you know, to say this, that like, I have received in full payment more and more. I'm well supplied. I'm well supplied having received from Ephraudatus the gifts you have sent, a fragrant offering. So he says, how much Paul is able to kind of really boldly say this? And, 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 and the answer, you know, is very simple. Paul is able to boldly say this because Christ is his strength. Christ is the one who makes this possible. And I think, you know, in verse 11, he says, I have learned in whatever state I am in, I am content. Whatever state we are in, are we content? Can we say the same thing like Paul said? I am content. I have learned. In whatever state I am, I am content. Paul was content, not just because of self-sufficiency, because of God's sufficiency. Paul did, not have, Paul did not have his dependence on, on the offerings or what he was getting from the Philippine church, but his dependence was on God. Paul was God-sufficient and not self-sufficient. Contentment is being satisfied in Christ. And, and contentment, you know, is not something that comes naturally. No. Contentment is to be learned Contentment is to be learned. It's not a natural thing, you know. By the nothing, you know, nothing else can satisfy. There are several things that we can go behind. Youngsters go behind several, several things to kind of satisfy themselves, but nothing can satisfy, I can tell you. Only God can provide satisfaction. And I think as we think about the blessings that God had showered upon us, let us use the opportunity to think about and to meditate upon the things that Paul writes in chapter 4, verse 8. Circumstances does not matter. I don't think we can complain. There are several times I have done that, like, you know, why God? Why is it happening? Many a times I've asked this question, but I think, you know, Probably I might have also blamed some of the circumstances. I would have blamed the people near me. It's because of the circumstance. It's because of him. But I feel like, you know, it is circumstances, circumstances does not matter. 
the secret to contentment is the full dependence on Christ. It's a complete dependence on Christ that he will provide our needs. That is, that is what contentment is. I've heard many missionaries and I've, I've lived that, you know, I've experienced that myself. I lost my, um, I mean, I lost my job in 2017 because, of course, not lost, I was retrenched because the, com the organization that I worked for closed. And I didn't kind of move into another organization or a job, but I had a desire to support the churches that we were already supporting. However, that did not kind of fetch any kind of revenue to me. Of course, being the head of the family, I need to bring food to the table. But something, you know, pushed me to kind of go ahead. And uh, it, I can say that, like, you know, for about eight months, I was supporting um, the churches to raise support sponsors for the children that we were supporting. You know, the Compassion, the organization that I was working in, had to pull off. But I was trying to make sure to raise local sponsors in India um, to support the children. And at those days, it used to be very difficult, but I feel that those days were such a wonderful time where um, my complete dependence was on God. None of, I mean, uh, for about eight months, I had to just live uh, with the salary that my wife was getting, and uh, we, I still do not know how God led me through that. And I think that is what I've been hearing from a lot of missionaries, that I'm living a life of faith. I'm living a life of faith and a complete dependence on God. And that is more and more satisfying than a lot of materialistic stuff that we keep purchasing or buying for ourselves. Maybe I think that, I'm not sure whether that provides contentment. So I myself have experienced that and I can say today that, you know, come what may, my dependence is going to be on God. And now on, like, you know, I've been able to see that, you know, whether I have job, whether I don't have a job, whether I have an education, I don't have an education, whether I'll be able to get a good, um, you know, course or not, if my dependence is on God, He is going to kind of provide what I need because the yeah, Bible clearly says, God shall supply all my needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And so, uh, and I think uh, Paul very clearly says that um, in also uh, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I think that is the surety, that is the confidence that we got to have today, that God provides His promises, the Word of God strengthens us. His ways strengthens us. His love strengthens us. And if I have to ask you the question about like, hey, uh, what is the biggest need? Is it going to be a physical need or a spiritual need? What would be your answer today? Probably, from my experience, you know, uh, what I've been through, our greatest need is not a bunch of money or not a bunch of possession. Our greatest need is to be saved from our sins. And very clearly, you know, even in compassion, we talk about this. We believe, we believe and uh, we also have this mission that releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name, and that's the mission of compassion. If we have to release the children from poverty, what do we mean by poverty? Why do we even, why do children or why do people live in poverty? So where down the line we've been able to talk about that and we came to a conclusion and we, and that's through a biblical perspective that the root cause of poverty is not the lack of money. It's not the lack of possession. It's not the lack of uh, education or lack of jobs. But the root cause of poverty is nothing but sin. And I think that's where we say that releasing children from poverty and nothing else can do that other than Jesus' name. So we release children from poverty in Jesus' name. And so I think that is the biggest need. Paul clearly talks about the greatest need for us is to be saved from our sins. And today if we are looking at, if we are hearing this message, and if you have not accepted or committed yourself to the Lord, and if you're still living in our sins, I think it's time for us to, you know, ask God that and, and come with open arms and say that, Lord, I have this need. I have this sin. And I want you to kind of 
release me from this sin and God is going to help us. And once when we kind of are released from our sins and I think that is where God builds us up. That is where God fills us, you know, our minds, our hearts with things that are edifying. Will you give everything and follow him? That's a big question for us. Are we ready to leave everything and to follow him? Let's remember that the, the life that we live here is a very momentary life compared to the eternal life that we are going to live in heaven. If we have to, you know, think about this life, you're going to miss the big, 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 big uh, treasure that's in heaven. Now, when you compare, this is just like, an, uh, uh, just like a, uh, a spark when you compare to the light in heaven. But one thing that takes you to heaven is your life here. How do you live your life on earth? That is what qualifies you to heaven. So would you be giving, willing to give up everything? Giving everything is contentment, not having everything. Giving everything is contentment. Contentment is seeing our joy in Christ. Contentment is seeing our joy in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for speaking to us this evening. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you would speak to each one of us. As we have heard your word, help us not to just keep being listeners or hearers of the word, but also be doers of the word. Today I pray for each one of us who are bowed down, including me. I pray that, Lord, that you would transform us. I pray that, Lord, that you would just fill us with your word. Lord, if our minds are already filled with things that are not pleasing you, I pray that you would just remove it today, Lord. We come before you and we just, Lord, lay down before you and ask you that you would just take away things that are not of you. Remove everything in our mind, Lord, that are not of you and fill it up with your word. Fill it up, Lord, with, with the ones that we just saw in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Lord, we just submit ourselves to you and Lord, we know that you are our strength. Christ is our strength. And that's all we need. That is all we need. Help us to accept you, Lord. Help us to, Lord, Lord have you and me lean, not lean on our own understanding. To have complete God dependence and not self-dependence. God satisfaction and not self-satisfaction. God's sufficiency and not self-sufficiency. Help us, Lord. As we, Lord, move out of this church, as we get into our day-to-day -day works, help us not to forget that, Lord, that you are our strength. And when you are there, there is nothing that we need anymore. We want to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.